Want to be the first to experience the terror? Support my podcast on Patreon and receive early access to all my episodes. Plus, access a library of over 50 bonus episodes. The link is in the description below. I'm not sure what wakes me. Maybe it's the low thrum of the diesel engine vibrating the walls, or the cold cone of light spilling across my trailer park ceiling at two in the morning. Whatever it is, it pulls me toward the window, groggy-eyed and yawning. I part the blinds, expecting to see some grumbling semi-driver clunking another mobile home into place. But instead, I see her. She climbs from an old Ford F-50, towing the ground like it's a thin sheet of ice, first one foot and then the other, easing from the seat with a quick glance up at the streetlight. I think she's around my age, 15, or maybe a bit younger. Her eyes are encased in a heart-shaped face, her features delicate, with an upturned nose centered over a chin that looks carved from glass. Something about her reminds me of the porcelain dolls mom keeps stashed on the top shelf of her closet, the ones trimmed in lace with their skin glazed and shining. A heavy thunk pulls my gaze to the driver's side door. A man stands there, huge, with a pair of meat slab arms and a bald head glittering with sweat. He stares at the girl for a long moment, then spits and pulls a blanket from the bed of the truck, spreading it carefully over the girl's head like he thinks the streetlight will give her a sunburn. A slow rising heat fills my chest as he shoves her roughly toward the mobile home. I know his type, the kind of guy who posts up on the porch with a 40 and a fat wad of chew stuffed in his lower lip, ready to have a go at his kids or his wife just for looking at him wrong. Light his fuse and watch him explode. Dad was that kind of guy before he abandoned me and mom to the trailer park. It never took much. I watched them disappear into the trailer with my breath fogging the glass. Something about the girl bothers me. The slack expression and the downcast eyes. The way she wrapped her arms around her chest, like maybe even breathing was too much work. It made me want to rush outside and give her a hug, to tell her everything would be okay. And that's what it is, I decide, identifying the thing bothering me. I've never seen someone so sad before. I'm up early the next morning and catch her dad, or whoever he is, hanging blackout curtains in the trailer's windows. A thick beard crawls up his neck, one I imagine to be teeming with cockroaches and beetles and various other sorts of shelled insects. His eyes are crooked, buried too close to the bridge of his nose, and his cheeks are lumpy. Like maybe whenever God put him together had a few too many drinks beforehand. His gaze twitches up and down as he works, glazed, one eyelid stretched wider than the other. After a bit, I close the blinds and wander into the kitchen for breakfast. Mom is humming and swaying in front of a frying pan, eggs sizzling, wearing the threadbare purple robe Dad gave her two Christmases ago. I sit down and trace my finger over an ancient syrup stain on the checkered tablecloth. We have new neighbors. Oh yeah? Who's that? Some girl and her dad. She spins around. A girl, huh? Your age? I think so. She arches an eyebrow and gives me a half smile. What? I ask, feigning confusion. Valley Acres isn't exactly teeming with teenagers, especially girls. Mostly, we've got a bunch of elementary kids playing in the dirt until their parents can afford a better school district. Well then, she says, we better make them some cookies, don't you think? I carry the tin over around noon, waving at our nosy neighbor, Mrs. Amblin, as I cross the street. She waves back from her lawn chair, a vodka tonic already sprouting from her sun-damaged hand. She treats the trailer park like it's a soap opera, which, to be fair, it mostly is. She's always hoping to catch a neighborhood argument or two, or an affair if she's lucky. Anything she can use to pass the time and fill her gossip jar. Her gaze crawls over the back of my neck as I go up the steps of the girl's trailer, 
hesitating for a moment when I spot the light fixture. It's been blacked out, glazed in a thick coat of paint. A few hasty splotches splattered and dripped down the door frame. I stare at the mess, confused, then knock once, twice, then three times before the bolt clicks and the door inches open. What you want? A voice asks with a warmth of a growl. Hi, I, uh, my name's Kyle. I brought you guys these. I raise the cookies. Welcome to the neighborhood. My smile comes out as a quick twitch of my lips before the door widens and the man steps out. He's even bigger up close. His gut leaking over a pair of worn jean shorts, a greasy handprint smeared across the thigh. He says nothing, only stares down at me with his mud-colored eyes and his arms crossed. I think he's going to tell me to screw off, but instead, he reaches out with a meaty palm to snatch the tin. You live around here, kid? Just across the street, I say, my gaze drifting behind him into the dim interior of the trailer. I see her there, the girl, buried in a pool of shadow. Her hand flutters up in a wave, and I raise my hand to return the gesture. But the man steps back inside with a half-mumbled thanks and slams the door shut before I can. Ah! Mrs. Amblin calls from across the street. Guess they won't be coming to any neighborhood barbecues. I roll my eyes at her, annoyed, but hopeful too, because I'm pretty sure the girl smiled at me before the door closed. A few nights later, I sneak back across the street with a handful of pebbles and toss one at her window. I'm coiled behind the hedgerow, ready to run if her dad appears. But on my fourth try, the curtains part, and I exhale as she peeks through. I stand and raise a hand, feeling stupid, like I'm in one of mom's cheesy romantic comedies, the idiot kid waving up at the girl from the lawn. Except in this version, I'm only a few feet away. And I'm pretty sure if he saw me, the girl's dad would kill me. She cracks her window, her face framed by an oil slick of dark hair. What are you doing? I, um, never got your name from the other day. Her eyes narrow. I never gave it. Yeah, sorry. It's just Winter. Huh? My name is Winter. Beautiful. Winter. It fits. I'm Kyle. I know. I heard. Oh, right. Idiot, I think to myself. The corners of her lips curl higher, and I can't help but notice that her skin's the color of moonlight. So, I say, trying to recover. Me and some friends are heading up to the lake in the morning. You want to tag along and meet a few of the other kids around here? Her smile wilts. I can't. Why not? My dad, he won't. A pair of headlights flash over my shoulder and send her scurrying into the dark of her room. She reappears a moment after they pass, her face tight and her gaze ticking over the road behind me. I just can't, I gotta go. My dad might hear us. Thanks for the cookies though. Wait, you maybe wanna talk again sometime? Like this? Her forehead tightens and she pulls a slice of cheek between her teeth with a tentative nod. Sure, I'd like that. Tomorrow. But wait until 11, okay? My dad is usually passed out by then. With that, she disappears, and I float back to my trailer helium happy, struggling to focus on anything other than my rapidly beating heart. The day passes like quicksand. I skip the lake, and help mom patch a hole in the drywall that's the size of dad's fist. Another memory of him sanded away. Good riddance. If only it were always so easy. A bit of sandpaper and some elbow grease so she could forget him forever. But I know she can't. His shadow is buried in the curve of her once broken nose and the way she flinches at sudden sounds like he might leap out of the closet at any minute, fists bared. Bastard. I hope he stays gone forever. If he doesn't, I don't know what I'll do. I don't like to think about it. All I know is I'll never let him hurt mom again. After dinner, I kill a few hours playing Xbox, 
and then tick off the rest by watching the hour hand circle the clock in my room. When it hits 11, I slip through the living room past mom, who's snoring away in front of some late night talk show, and make my way outside and across the street. Winter is waiting for me this time, her window sliding open at my approach. Hey, she says. Hi, I reply, my palms already sweating. So we, I nod toward her dad's room. Are we, uh, good? She tucks a glossy lock of her hair behind her ear. Yeah, he's asleep. A warm buzz runs through me. We have time. So, where are you from? I ask. The answer is Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And this is her fifth move in the last four years. She likes indie music and fried pickles and wants to travel to Alaska someday to see the glaciers and the humpbacks. I tell her a little about myself, how I can't wait to graduate and move to Austin to start a career in computer programming. I'd rather do anything other than work in the oil fields like dad did before he left. The next night, I talk about him a little too. Tell her how he chased some greasy haired waitress to Houston and how me and mom are better off with him gone. She goes quiet for a bit, listening to me then fills me in on how her mom died of cancer when she was five and how she inherited her mother's allergy to the sun. It has something to do with ultraviolet light. It's the reason her dad won't let her out of the trailer because she'll burn in seconds. She says he cares, that he always does what's best for her, but the way her mouth tightens when she talks about him gives me doubts. On the fourth night, she waves me closer with a playful flip of her wrist. Hey, you want to see something cool? I nod and edge through the shrubs next to her window. I feel my skin tingle being this close to her. She fades into her room and swirls back after flipping on a small lamp near her bed. Scarlet light bleeds through the lampshade, painting the walls in a mix of crimson pink tones. Her room is bare, except for a few posters tacked here and there. One of a mare tossing its mane and another of Yosemite's half dome at sunrise. Watch this, she says, raising her hands. She laces her fingers together and a shadow spreads over her door. It's a bird, something a kindergartner would draw in art class. But then she flutters her fingers and the shadow grows, transforming into a lush set of wings, followed by a bloom of tail feathers and a beak. She curves her arms, hands flapping, and the shadow flies, actually flies across her ceiling. The motion so fluid, so lifelike, I almost expect it to burst through her window. Then, without warning, the shadow rips down over her wall straight toward me. I stumble back and trip over a row of flower pots at my feet. Several crash to the rocks. Winter flashes me an, oh God, look. Her eyes snapping wide as the door smacks open down the hall. Go! She hisses, whipping the curtains shut. I dive into the hedges instead. I don't have time to run since her old man would hear me for sure. He barrels into her room, his voice angry and dripping sleep. The hell's going on in here? Why is the window open? Winter says nothing, and I imagine her dad's concrete gaze surveying the walls, the floor, looking for something off, something not quite right. I hear her curtains tear open a second later, and I try to still my breathing despite the swarm of mosquitoes ravaging my neck. I twitch as one bites, and I'm sure he's seen me, is about to jump over the windowsill and snap my neck when winter speaks. I was hot. I needed some air. Silence. Then... And the boss? I heard a cat. It... She's cut off by the unmistakable sound of a slap, flesh on flesh, followed by a sharp cry. I cringe and ball my fists in my lap. Asshole. You're lying, he says, fury creeping into his voice. Don't you lie to me. No, no, I promise. It was... It's that boy, ain't it? The one that came by the other day. Don't think I didn't catch the way you were looking at him. No, no, Dad. I, I swear I wasn't... Bullshit. The window slams down. And all I can do is sit there trembling with rage, thinking, I will kill you if you touch her again. I will kill you. I will kill you. I will kill you. 
He boards up her window in the morning. The sharp tack of nails and plywood wakes me, and I slump over to the blinds with my scalp prickling, wondering what the hell's going on. He's out there banging away as if what he's doing is as normal as picking weeds. I widen the blinds to get a better view, and the hammer stops mid-stroke, hanging there. When he turns, his eyes are flat and black, like those of a trout. A nail juts from the corner of his mouth. He stares at me, unflinching, until a wave of nausea twists through my gut. I glance down, unable to hold his gaze. When I look back again, he's gone. She's in trouble, I tell mom at breakfast. Who? The girl, Winter. Her dad's not right. She pushes back from the table and reaches for the crumpled pack of camel lights on the counter shakes one loose and plants it between her lips and lights it. Hmm, how so? He boarded over her window. We need to do something. She takes a deep drag, the tip burning cherry red. Now, Kyle, you know we can't do that. Why not? Because it's none of our business, is it? She grabs her plate and stands, apparently done with the conversation. Now, help me clean up. And there it is the broken piece of her. The piece that kept dad around long after she should have cut him loose. I grab my plate and toss it in the sink, my fork clattering to the floor. She spins on me, voice sharp. Kyle, what's gotten into- But I'm already gone, storming back to my room. It doesn't take long to figure out his pattern. Out of the trailer at 7.30, dressed in his faded orange construction gear, tool belt strapped tight beneath his gut, home by five. I watch him for a couple days to make sure, gone at 7.30, home by five, before I decide to go over. The guy is punctual, if nothing else. Outside, the sky is cloudy, the air so thick with moisture that it feels like I'm walking through a bowl of chowder soup. Mrs. Amblin is already stretched out on her lawn chair, wearing a massive floppy sun hat and reading an old people magazine with a set of oversized sunglasses perched on the bridge of her nose. She pulls them down as I pass, flashing me her red lipstick smile. The one that says, I'm watching, always watching. I wave at her, nothing to see here, and bound up winter steps. She answers on the fourth knock, the door cracking open with a stale whiff of air. Hey, she says. Hi, you maybe want to... The words die on my tongue when I spot the swamp of purple devouring her eye. He did that? She nods. Winter. Her eyes harden. He was right to. There are things about me, us, you don't know. I know a father shouldn't hit his daughter. I say it with more force than I intend, the anger in my voice setting her back a step. She eyes me like she sees something new. Like maybe I'd hit her too, if she made me mad enough. Look, I gotta go, Kyle, she says, moving to close the door. I'm sorry I scared you. Wait, I say, planting a hand against the wood. Are you talking about the bird? Because that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I'm not lying. It's all I've thought about the last few days. How the hell she did that? The rush of feathers and that liquid smooth motion as it flew across the wall. Her face lights up like a pale sunrise, that first warm glow of the day. I take a chance and grab her hand, her palm cool against mine as I tug her outside. What are you doing? She asks, not really resisting. Let's go to the park for a bit. It's right down the street. She looks skyward with a hard swallow. I can't, the sun, it won't do anything. I swing up the umbrella I brought, mom's white and yellow striped one. And besides, it's cloudy today. No sun, see? I step aside for her to look out, which she does with a quick glance up at the bank of clouds forming overhead. I don't know. Come on, I plead. When's the last time you had some fun? It's been a while. I give her my best puppy dog eyes and curl my hands over my chest like a set of paws. Please. (laughs) She giggles and blows at her bangs with a sigh. Yeah, okay, 
but only for a few minutes. The park is busier than I've seen in ages. The playground buzzing with kids. Moms flank the sides and chat in clusters of twos and threes. Dogs wheel over the grass, chasing after orange and yellow frisbees. A group of knobby kneed sixth graders smash into each other, playing flag football. I lead winter away from all the chaos. We sit on a bench nestled next to a huge birch tree. It takes a good five minutes for her shoulders to unclench and five more before she stops glancing up at the sky like she half expects to catch fire. Then she's staring at me with those dazzling blue eyes of hers, little flecks of green swimming through her irises like glitter. Thanks, she says, I needed this. Her hand slips into mine and my heart beats a little faster. I figured we stay like that, hand in hand, quiet, listening to the leaves rustle with the breeze while I work up the courage to ask her the question that's been bothering me since she moved in. When I finally do, my voice nearly cracks. Are you okay? I mean, with your dad and all. She blinks and sighs. <sighs> he means well. He's a little overprotective after what happened to mom. With the cancer? Her eyebrows arch like she doesn't know what I'm talking about, then settle quickly back into place. Cancer? Yeah, I mean, sort of. But it's more than that. It's... She rubs her arm and glances around like she's just realized she's outside. I... I can't talk about it. I... should go. I'm sorry, Kyle. This was a mistake. I'm not safe for you. My mouth unhinges as she stands. Not safe for you? I'm about to apologize and tell her I overstepped when a football thumps down near the bench. A boy runs up to retrieve it, his cheeks puffing red beneath a pile of rice-colored hair. Sorry, he says, bending to grab it. We were just... His eyes flick first at Winter and then at me, his mouth agape. What? What is that? He asks, pointing at Winter's feet. It takes me a moment to see what he does. Winter's shadow is rippling in the grass, moving like the surface of a pond disturbed by a rock. I blink at it and rub my eyes. It's still there when I open them, but wavering, expanding across the turf like an anorexic version of Winter. The arms are unnaturally long, the fingertips wire thin and quivering. She gasps and stumbles sideways, tripping as she does. The umbrella flies from her hand and her shadow writhes in the sudden spray of light, boiling as tongues of flame spark around its edges. She scrambles back, 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 pulling the shadow with her, the shadow growing in size, an arm slithering through the grass toward the boy. It's then I realize that the sun has burned through the clouds. A flurry of thin as bone fingers curl over the boy's shin and slide up his thigh. His mouth peels open in a shriek a second before he rips past me through the grass toward the shadow's jaw. Help me, help me! I dive for his hand and seize a handful of his shirt instead. He jerks to a stop, and I struggle to hold on as my forearm rivers with veins. The boy's eyes bulge, the stitches of his sleeves tearing one by one, and then he's gone, catapulting across the turf toward the thing's mouth. His feet dissolve first, followed by his legs and waist. I lie in the grass, stupefied, watching what's left of him sinking lower, turning to a fine carbon mist. Run, Kyle, run! Winter's voice cuts through the fog in my brain like an electric current. I jerk upright and lurch away from the shadow, slamming back down again as a searing heat bleeds through my ankle. I roll over to see Winter scrambling for the umbrella, but she can't gain any traction, the shadow somehow anchoring her in place. My hands tear out chunks of grass as the shadow drags me closer, slivers of dirt carving out beneath my fingernails. Panic surges up my throat as my foot nears its maw and plunges in. The pain is incredible, like my leg is being dunked into a pot of boiling water so hot it feels cold. Sparks flicker through my vision and I almost pass out. A blur of motion cuts in front of me toward winter, a figure with tree trunk arms carrying a blanket his eyes are closed set, his bald head shining in the sun. The pressure in my calf releases and I look down to nothing, no foot, no shin, just a pile of charred, oozing flesh and bits of ash drifting higher, spinning toward a quickly blurring sky. 
The police question me in the hospital a week after I wake up. They grill me until a nurse orders them out with a snide. That's enough. He's in no shape for this. It isn't until I'm discharged that they drag me downtown for a second round. No, officer. I don't know what happened to the girl or her father. No, sorry. I have no clue about their last name. I wish I did. Yes, the boy dissolved into a shadow, same as my leg. In the end, I guess they have too many corresponding witness accounts, too many strange descriptions of what happened, to charge me with the boy's disappearance, or charge anyone else for that matter. All they have are a bunch of nonsensical statements and a grief-stricken mother in search of answers that will never come. I know, because I want them myself. The letter arrives six months later. I'm out on the porch sipping a tall glass of lemonade when the mailman spots me. He glances at my stubbed knee, then the envelope in his hand, and brings it up the steps. I think this is for you, he says, handing it to me with a look I've grown accustomed to. A blend of pity and relief. Pity for me. Relief, it isn't him. I hold the letter in my hands as he shambles away. The envelope's wrinkled. The top of the address, Kyle Carrington, 11080 Swallow Way, smudged in spots, like whoever wrote it down was crying. I carefully slit the crease and pull out the piece of paper folded inside. Kyle, it's hard for me to write this. After what I did to you and that boy, there are no words. Nothing I can say or do will fix things. All I know is you made me happy and all I did was hurt you. It's all I've ever done, really, just hurt people, especially the ones I love. My mom, my dad, you. He saved you, you know, my dad did. He brought you to the hospital after that old woman across the street told him where we'd gone. I read the rest of it, my eyes pouring over every word, every letter, my stomach sinking and then went to my bedroom and pulled the blinds shut. A foul shiver swims up my arm and stitches its way back down my spine. Winter's letter swims through my brain. That thing in the park changed me. I've suspected it for a while now. The way my shadow wavers and curls in the sun. The motion unnatural, like it's moving on its own. And indoors, how it slides over the walls like a flicker of smoke when touched by the lamp light. I close my eyes and let the last line crash through my head like a thunderstorm. Kyle, I'm so sorry, but whatever you do, you must never, ever go outside. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.